Hi everyone, welcome to this AP Environmental Science um, lecture on the Endangered Species Act, CITES, and the IUCN Red List in no specific order. So the learning objectives for this are going to look a little bit different than usual. Um, be able to describe and apply the Endangered Species Act and CITES to specific situations and be able to identify um, the conservation status of either of a species on the Endangered Species Act or the IUCN Red List. Now, the reason that this is a little bit different looking is because AP um, does not provide me with um, topics or learning objectives for the specific legislation that you need to know, but you do need to know 11 pieces of legislation. Those are both international pieces of legislation and US policy. Two of those we're going to talk about today, and that is CITES and the Endangered Species Act. The rest of them we'll talk about um, on other days because these are the two that apply to uh, biodiversity. The IUCN Red List is not one of these pieces of legislation, but I think that's important and um, you'll see these um, um, conservation statuses, so you should know what it is. The vocab is real short. There's only just these uh, four things. Um, critical habitat does apply to the Endangered Species Act. And again, this is a little bit out of order from what we'll have. So I'm gonna start with the IUCN Red List. Um, this is again, one of the ones that is not on the AP standards, but I think that it's important for you to know. This is the International Union for Conservation of Nature Red List of Threatened Species. Basically what the IUCN Red List does is they um, provide the conservation status of all species on the planet, or at least all species um, as far as they've gotten to this date. So it was established in 1964. Um, you don't need to know the specific dates for any of the things that we're talking about in this PowerPoint, so don't memorize the dates, but it was established in 1964. Um, I would encourage you to go onto these uh, two websites and read through their background history, um, their background and history, and then on this just main page, just explore it. I think that it's really interesting and, you know, type in any species that you're interested in. If you're interested in Bengal tigers, type in Bengal tigers and just read about them and their conservation status and, and everything. I think it's really interesting just to explore this website. But the goal of the IUCN Red List is to provide scientifically based information on the status and species and subspecies at a global level, to draw attention to the magnitude and importance of threatened biodiversity, to influence national and international policy and decision making, and to provide information to guide actions to conserve biological diversity. And this is copied straight from their website or quoted straight from their website. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. They do this scientifically. So they um, they are looking at scientific data um, to describe species status. So the status, uh, the conservation status, which we'll see on the next um, slide um, of species and subspecies. So there's both sub, um, species level conservation status and if it applies subspecies level conservation status. For example, all, tiger species, all tigers on the planet are one species, but there's multiple subspecies. There's the Amur or uh, Siberian tiger, there's the Bengal tiger, there's the Sumatran tiger, there's the Malaysian tiger. All of those different tiger subspecies have um, conservation status as well as the species as a whole. All right. They're looking at a global level, so not at a local level. Um, <clears throat> talking about biodiversity, and then they influence national and international policy and decision making. So that's also very important. They have a voice at um, the national and international um, levels, and they lobby and do all the stuff that you know people do with governments to influence policy. Okay, and their entire goal is to conserve biological diversity. So this is their their categories for conservation status, and it's it is the most widely used classification system um, in the world. So I think that this one is important to know um, because um, these these are what you will see when you look at different species. Even if you just go onto Wikipedia um, and search for um, you know giant panda, you're going to see something that looks very much like this, um, and they'll talk about they'll show where the giant panda is on this. Okay. Um, so extinct, this is beyond any reasonable doubt that the species no longer exists, that there is no living members on the planet, okay? A species can be extinct in the wild, meaning that it survives only in captivity. So extinct and extinct in the wild are different. Um, extinct is just no living members, and then extinct in the wild means that there's no living members in the wild, but there's still living members of that species in captivity. 
There is also a term in biology called functionally extinct. They don't have that um, on here, and you don't need to know it really for the IUCN Red List. Um, but functionally extinct essentially means that um, that that popul like that once those individuals die, it's going to be extinct. For example, if there is only two males of a species left and those are the only two individuals on the planet they are definitely not going to repopulate the population because it's two males so they would be functionally extinct even if there's two members and they'd probably be extinct in the wild at the same time um, but you don't need to know that it's just a little bit of an aside critically endangered that means that they're very likely to become extinct um, endangered means that they're very high risk of being extinct in the wild vulnerable high risk of extinction without any intervention all three of these are what we would call threatened. So they are at different levels of being threatened, but they are threatened nonetheless. Okay. Um, <clears throat> NT means near threatened, so they're close to being uh, vulnerable. They're kind of um, maybe populations are starting to decline or habitat is starting to be lost and they're starting to be noticed and they're near threatened. Least concerned means that we don't have to worry about them. Okay, so think about uh, like crows or pigeons. They are everywhere and they're going to do just fine even in human um, infested areas. Okay, so they're least concerned. There's a couple other um, ones that I have on the bullet points that are not in the diagram. Uh, data deficient, that means that there's not enough data to classify. A lot of species are data deficient. Um, and like I said, these this, they do this scientifically. And if there's not the data there, if people haven't done the studies or um, gone out into the field and done the research, then there may not be enough data to, um, to class them. Um, another example of why something would be data deficient is if they were just um, just found and just scientifically named in that case if they they might be straight to endangered because they might be so new and brand new that there's so few individuals that they might be highly uh, threatened but in some cases they might also be data deficient other um, organisms such as bacteria typically data deficient okay we're not really worried about them we're not really we're more so worried about um, you know plants animals for whatever reason. And then not evaluated, they haven't been studied, and therefore there's no data to classify them. Okay, so you guys should know this. Um, what I would know is these ones, not those guys, just because they don't really um, show up anywhere. Okay, our next uh, piece of legislation. Um, in fact, the IOC and Red List isn't really a piece of, organ of legislation. It's not legislation at all. It's um, it's a international body. It's a uh, it's it's an organization, but CITES is a piece of legislation. So the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, abbreviated CITES, um, also called the Washington Convention, but you'll probably never see that term, so I wouldn't memorize it. The purpose of CITES is to protect endangered plants and animals um, through trade. So by ensuring that international trade does not threaten the survival of the species in the wild. Okay. Um, it was a result of a 1963 meeting of the IUCN. So, you know, very recent in the inception of the IUCN or very early in the inception of the IUCN. It was ratified and signed in 1973 and then effective in 1975, so the mid-70s. And this is one of the largest and oldest conservation agreements in existence. And again, you guys do not need to know dates, so don't worry about dates. Okay, so one of the things about CITES is that um, participation is voluntary. You can't force a country to sign on to this. So it is um, a voluntary organization, um, you know, by nation. And as of 2016, there was 183 parties, including 182 countries, and then the EU counts as a party. Okay, so in this map, the red ones are the parties, and then anything that is gray is not a party, with the exception of Greenland, which um, should, I believe, be governed by Denmark, okay? Um, you notice many island nations in the Pacific and the Caribbean, um, even some in the Atlantic, as well as Antarctica, which doesn't have, um, it's, it's not a nation, it's not a government. There's a couple African countries, couple Asian countries, um, but most countries are part of CITES. So again, CITES operates through trade. So they really focus on trade of um, endangered species or any 
type of threatened species. Okay, so they look at um, harvesting, imports, and exports, and they must be authorized through a licensing system. So they have their own licensing system. Now, this harvesting part typically doesn't happen. Usually, they're just looking at imports and exports. So that's usually what's going on. Okay, so they're not looking at CITES isn't really um, looking at the, the poachers that are killing these elephants for their ivory, but they are confiscating that ivory as it goes through um, the trade system. Okay, uh, currently there's about 6,000 animal species and about 33,000 plant species that are protected. Some of them are a little bit difficult to uh, protect because of uh, different ways that uh, people can get around the system. For example, um, Central American mahogany, um, Honduran mahogany is um, on CITES, but Sapele and African mahogany are not. And you can see that these woods look very similar to one another, and it'd be very easy for somebody to harvest Central American mahogany, slap a sign on it that says African mahogany, and then sell that on the international market. Okay, so sometimes it is difficult to enforce. It's very difficult to regulate. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Species on CITES are divided into three appendices. We're gonna start with appendix one, which are the most threatened and the most protected. So it includes about 1200 species. These are threatened with extinction or are heavily affected by trade. And the trading, um, trade or capture of these species is strictly prohibited except if they are captive bred animals or cultivated plants. So for example, if, I mean, none of these animals are captive bred, but say that somebody is captive breeding rhinoceros for, I, I, for their horns, okay? It's not happening as far as I know, but let's just hypothetically say that that's happening. Then that individual rhinoceros, those individual horns would be put onto appendix two. Okay, so it's a little bit complicated, but you don't really have to worry about that. Just know that it's illegal to trade these um, animals, trade these plants, or to harvest them from the wild. Okay, some notable species, uh, the red panda, the western gorilla, the chimpanzee, um, all tiger species, the Asiatic lion. Yes, there are lions in Asia, so the Asiatic lion. Most leopard species, so different species of leopards. The jaguar, so um, in South and Central America. The cheetah, African elephant. Um, this really should be the African, um, not bush elephant, but forest elephant. Uh, Dugon and manatees are both on there, all rhinoceros species and some populations of the African bush elephant. Okay. Um, really, when you think of an endangered species, especially if that is an endangered species that has a anything of market value, then it's probably on appendix one. If not, then it'll be on appendix two. Now, you might be wondering why some of these um, why some of these species are being traded. Why would anybody trade jaguar or cheetah? In that case, it's probably for, um, it's probably trophy hunting, okay? So people shooting the animal, uh, cutting off their heads and taxidermying the heads and mounting them on a wall or taxidermying the entire body and having them in their foyer or their dining room or something, or just having their pelts, just having their furs, okay? So just sh shooting them for trophy hunting. If it's rhinoceros or elephant, then it's probably for horns or tusks, okay, respectively. Um, gorillas, uh, Western gorillas are a um, interesting example where they are poached primarily for their hands and for their heads. So people will, um, people use their hands traditionally as like a marriage, um, a, um, like part of, not, not part of a dowry, but part of the ceremony of being married in some West African countries. And because there is a lot of people, there is a lot of demand for gorilla hands and they are um, being poached. Okay, so all of these have different reasons why they're on this list. Very few of them just for meat, most of them for other reasons. Plus there are the plants, but we're just really gonna focus on animals here. Uh, appendix two. So this is about 38,000 species. So a lot more species on appendix two. These aren't necessarily threatened with extinction, though some of them are, um, but they may become so unless trade in those species is regulated. So without regulation, they are on their way to becoming critically endangered um, or maybe even just endangered, okay? 
Um, trade is permitted with permits. So you need permits for trade. However, different countries have their own rules, have their own laws, um, and those permits may or not may or may not be required for the country. So let's say that somebody is capturing pangolins in a Southeast Asian country that does not require a permit. And then they are sending them to China, which does not require a permit. That's going to escape everything to do with CITES. Okay. So all of these bags are all pangolin scales and you've probably seen pangolins on the news. Um, they are these small little scaled mammals, which is very odd, but their hair instead of being hair is convert uh, is uh, modified into scales. Um, still keratin, still basically hair still forms as um, hair would, um, but the scales are used in traditional uh, Chinese medicine and there is a very, very high demand for them so much so that they are being poached to uh, the brink of extinction. Okay, or at least they're becoming endangered. Um, some notable species on this list, great white shark, American black bear, ironwood, big leaf mahogany, emperor scorpion, green iguanas, Hartman's mountain zebra, which is up here. Um, some pangolin species, um, some are on appendix one actually. And then some populations of African bush elephant. Okay, so you notice that like African bush elephants, one species, different populations may be on appendix one or appendix two, depending on how that population is doing. And then there's appendix three. Appendix three is really small at about 200 species. This is just listed when one member country basically asks another member country or another party for assistance in controlling the trade of that species. So say that um, in Ghana, the marsh buck is being hunted heavily and it's being uh, shipped over um, over their borders. They might ask neighboring countries to help, um, you know, stop that trade and marsh buck so that poaching stops. Um, alligator snapping turtles are sold as pets, um, captured, wild caught, captured, um, and then sold on the international pet trade. So the U.S. has asked member countries to stop the um, the import of um, of uh, you know little baby Afri um, alligator snapping turtles. Okay, the trade's permitted, but you have to have a valid export permit and certificate of origin. Okay, so if you were to uh, wild capture a African snapping turtle, or sorry, African alligator snapping turtle, um, and try to ship it to Canada or to Mexico, uh, you would need a valid export permit and you'd have to have a certificate of origin. Um, chances are you won't get those. Okay, CITES is great. I don't want to have um, anybody out there say that CITES isn't uh, great and that they're not trying to do the right thing. However, there is a lot of criticisms about CITES. The first is that it does not supersede national laws. Okay, so every member nation, every member party has to adapt CITES regulations um, around their domestic legislature. Okay, so they have um, national laws supersede CITES. So that's one big criticism. Another big criticism, kind of skipping down a little bit, is that there's no CITES police. Okay, so you have to work with um, local police, local um, forest rangers, local, um, you know, local people on the ground. You don't have um, this CITES police that can monitor um, docks and airports and everywhere where shipping happens. Okay. Um, so that is also a huge criticism. Um, this is a little bit dated, 20 years old, but as of 2002, 50% of parties lacked one or more of these agreements. And these are pretty major. Um, active management and scientific authorities, like scientists on the ground and people actively managing these populations of animals and plants, pretty major. Laws prohibiting the trade of CITES species, I don't know how you're gonna enforce this at the local level if you don't have laws at the local level. Right. Um, penalties for illegal trade. So um, even if something is on CITES and even if there is a law there, there may not be penalties for that or a blind eye may be turned. OK, corruption is rampant around the world. Um, and then laws allowing the confiscation of illegal specimens. So, um, you know, again, local legislation. Um, Another criticism is that a single species may be listed on several appendices, and that creates confusion. So let's say that we have ant confusion and the ability to um, cheat the system. So let's take the example of the African bush elephant. Some populations of the African bush elephant are doing really well. Some populations are doing very, very poorly. 
And some of populations are on Appendix 2, the ones that are doing you know, somewhat well, and the ones on Appendix 1 are the ones that are not doing well at all. Or the ones that are being heavily poached or in um, areas where they're um, being heavily poached. Okay. Um, say that somebody poaches an African bush elephant from Appendix 1. And then they, you know, work around the system. Maybe there's some corruption involved. They get some permits to sell it as an Appendix 2 species or an Appendix 2 population. They mislabel it as an Appendix 2 population. So they might still be poaching it from Appendix 1 and then, you know, through corruption, get paperwork and then try to sell it as an Appendix 2. Okay. And then there's reservations. So CITES does allow for reservations um, based on economics. Um, for example, Norway, Iceland, and Japan have reservations on several species of baleen whale. Okay, so they can still practice whaling. In my opinion, the biggest criticism that I have with CITES is that it focuses on trade. Okay, it doesn't address habitat loss. It doesn't address poaching. It doesn't address the poverty that leads to poaching. It doesn't. Um, you know, restore ecosystems or promote sustainability, all that it does is focus on trade. So if we go back, if you think back to the picture of the, um, of all of the ivory tusks from elephants that were arranged on a table, um, CITES may confiscate, like, you know, local police or local officials working with CITES may um, confiscate those that ivory and then typically burn that ivory so that it doesn't go on the, to the international market. But what they don't address is the killing of the elephants because you have to kill the elephant to get the ivory. So it doesn't address the poaching. It doesn't address the killing. It doesn't address um, the habitat loss. It doesn't address any ecosystem restoration. The animal is already dead by the time that CITES gets involved. Okay, or that CITES um, applies. So that's my biggest criticism is that you need some of those preventative measures um, so the animal isn't killed in the first place. All right, um, this second bullet point we'll also see in the Endangered Species Act a little bit, but once you list a species, that might increase financial speculation um, and cause even more poaching, right? Prices rise, it's more rare, it's more, um, um, it's it's uh, di more difficult to obtain, goes onto the black market, and then prices rise and more poaching ensues because, again, poverty is what leads to poaching. You don't have rich people poaching. You have the poor poaching selling it to the rich. Okay, It's all about supply and demand. And then CITES is a negative list. A lot of people think that if CITES was a positive list, it'd be a lot better. So a positive list basically says, these are the things that you can trade. A negative list just says, don't trade these things, but anything else that we don't address is fair game. So if people rather had the idea of a positive list saying, you can trade this and you can trade that and you can trade this, then anything off of that would be um, automatically off the table. Right. Um, and obviously poaching and legal trade still continue and there are reforms in the work, there always is. All right, and finally, let's get to the Endangered Species Act, um, abbreviated ESA. Um, this is a U.S. law, so this does not apply for any other country at all. This is just a U.S. law. Okay. Um, the purpose of it is to protect at-risk um, species from extinction as a consequence of economic growth and development untampered by adequate concern and conservation. And again, quoted right out of the act. Protect species as well as the ecosystems upon which they depend, and species are listed based solely on the best scientific and commercial data available, not economics. Okay, that's really important. So economics um, does not have a voice in the Endangered Species Act, whether something is listed or not, whether something is put onto, whether a species is put onto the Endangered Species Act or not. Now. The Endangered Species Act was signed into law in 1973, or at least enacted in 1973. They did, five years later, put economics into it. However, in 1983, an additional five years, they took it out. So in 1978, they basically said that um, if it was in the financial interest of the country, um, or in certain cases of individuals, then to just harvest a species to extinction, then that's okay. And we're not gonna list that species on the Endangered Species Act, and we're just gonna sell it to extinction. They took that out in 1983, okay? So economics does not have a voice 
in the Endangered Species Act. So a little bit of background, I want to talk about a little bit about where the Endangered Species Act came from. However, you don't really need to know these other acts, so I'll just breeze right through them, even though they are all really important in their own right. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was just growing awareness of the loss of biodiversity and especially the extinction of species um, in the United States. Okay, so the whooping crane and the bison had heavy population loss, right? The bison were just um, down to a few hundred individuals, the whooping cranes down to a few tens of individuals. And then there was the extinction of the passenger pigeon. And you read some of the writings about the passenger pigeon, about how they um, existed in probably the billions that you would have in like a single flock of passenger pigeons that would take off from the forest on a sunny day and it would darken the skies it would eclipse the sun with how many birds there were in a single flock and people hunted them literally to extinction um as well as habitat loss but they hunted them to extinction because people used to eat a lot of pigeon um it's kind of like you know a small chicken right um so there was growing awareness and growing and a growing sense of environmental stewardship in the United States. Okay, there was unregulated hunting, there was unregulated fishing, trapping, and then there was rampant habitat loss as people cleared um, forests and grassland, primarily for farmland. Okay. Um, some early U.S. laws and treaties. Again, you don't need to know these. These are just background info. The first one. Um, is in 1900, the Lacey Act, that's the first federal law to regulate wild animal markets, okay? Uh, then there was the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which was basically an agreement between the US and Canada, which regulated the hunting of migratory birds, all right? So let's say that you have um, Canadian geese, they're still protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, Canadian geese fly down from Canada in large part, sometimes Alaska, down to the uh, contiguous United States during the uh, during the winter, and then fly back up to Canada to nest um, during the summer. Okay, so neither country can hunt them because they're a migratory bird and cross that border. Um, international agreement for the regulation of whaling was huge um, as the whaling industry uh, tanked and as we had uh, replacements for whale oil, primarily petroleum, um, we um, started regulating the hunting of whales to maintain what populations remained. Then there was the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, and then the Endangered Species Preservation Act, and then an amendment to that. And then finally, we have the Endangered Species Act. Now you notice that there is a lot of species that are in a lot of different pieces of legislation. And President Richard Nixon also identified that and thought that those current laws were inadequate and that there also was just kind of this jumble of laws. So he called on Congress to create one new comprehensive law that would protect all endangered species. Okay, so that became the Endangered Species Act. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Um, it was written by a team of lawyers and scientists, but it was led by scientists. So this is one of those rare instances where a law um, that is has scientific basis was actually written by scientists. All right, it had to be involved lawyers as well because it had to be le written in legalese, like the language of law. Of law, but it was led by scientists. One of the authors um, said that th that they thought that they like that they were doing what we thought was scientifically valid and right for the environment. So it really was um, what they thought was right for the environment. Signed to law in 1973, and um, you know it says of 1972 because that's when it was written, but signed into law in 1973, it's the Magna Carta of the environmental movement. The Endangered Species Act is um, federally regulated, and it's regulated within two administrations um, in the federal government. If the species on it is a freshwater or a terrestrial species, so a freshwater fish or any other freshwater um, animal or species, plant as well, or a terrestrial species, one on land, then it's um, regulated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. If it is a marine species, so a species that exists in saltwater, then it is the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is a division of NOAA which is the National, um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration.
So there are 17 sections to the Endangered Species Act. You absolutely do not need to know all of them. You don't really need to know what these sections are, so you can ignore the different sections here. But I just had it for because it helped me think and organize stuff. Um, the federal government is the one that determines whether a species is to be listed or not, basically put on the Endangered Species Act. So included in the act. If they are listed, critical habitat must be designated for that species. So all species obviously exist within um, a specific ecosystem or you know, maybe several in some cases, and they all have their habitat in those ecosystems. So critical habitat has to be designated and set aside for those um, species. However, not all species that are listed have critical habitat listed. There is a loophole that exists, um, but those that do have over two times recovery rate than those that don't. Obviously, if you're gonna protect the habitat, then the species is gonna do better than if you don't protect the habitat, okay? It's illegal to kill, um, harm, or harass a listed species. We call that take, okay? I don't know why it's called take, but kill, harm, or harass. So you can't even harass an endangered species. It's illegal. You can get fined or end up in jail. Some rare exceptions do exist, um, notably for indigenous um, populations, so like First Nation populations, um, or First Nation people, I should say. I'm too much of a biologist. I say populations for everything. Um, endangered fish or wildlife cannot be taken without a take permit. Okay. Um, federal agencies are responsible for the conservation of endangered and threatened species. Federal agencies cannot knowingly jeopardize a listed species or destroy any critical habitat, and any commercial import or export is generally prohibited. That includes both international and over state lines. The conservation status on the endangered species list is way simpler than it is on um, the IUCN red list. You have E for endangered, that's in danger of extinction, T for threatened, mean that's likely to become endangered, and then C for candidate under consideration for official listing. Okay, there are positive outcomes of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there are definitely positive outcomes. Um, millions of acres of habitat have been protected in the United States um, for not only the species that is listed that causes that habitat to be protected, but any other species that shares that habitat with them, right? You might protect a black-footed ferret, but you're also protecting that habitat for pronghorn antelope and for the grasses and the wildflowers and the birds and anything else that shares that habitat with the, um, with the ferret. Uh, there are delisted species. So 11, I believe 11 species have been delisted off the Endangered Species Act. You can view those here. The, one of the unfortunate things about recording using this program is that I can't open internet pages and still record videos. Uh, same thing with um, species that have increased in population size. I would encourage you to check out this Wikipedia page about three quarters of the way down at the positive effects section to look at those species that have increased in population size. One of those is the black-footed ferret. This is a Colorado example, so I thought it'd be great to talk about it. There, even in northern Colorado around Greeley is the National Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center, which is really cool. I would encourage you to go if you're ever up in that area. Black-footed ferret used to exist in this entire region that's shaded in, um, was down to only a handful of individuals, um, but through breeding programs and because it was listed on the Endangered Species Act and because critical habitat was set aside, its population has risen and uh, they're doing rather well right now. However, there are criticisms of the Endangered Species Act and just like, the, um, just like CITES, it is a great piece of legislation and it is doing a like absolutely necessary job. And I don't wanna sound as though I'm coming down too hard on it, but there are definitely seen um, some criticisms. One of those is that it's often seen as industry versus environment or ec the economy versus the environment. It shouldn't be, but that's how it is, especially um, in the political arena, all right? So industry may lose profits from some lost opportunities, but um, you know, so be it, I don't care. Um, typically, it's from the permitting process and land grants, but um, when they destroy critical habitat, they shouldn't be allowed to do that and they can lose profits from that. So say that there is a uh, timber company in the Southern United States and they're looking at old growth longleaf pine forests to harvest and to, um, and to sell the timber from it. Well, they can't because that's where the red cockaded woodpecker lives. So, you know, you know what, so be it. 
maybe there is a little bit of industry versus environment, but there really shouldn't be. Um, we've taken so much that what remains is such a fraction of what it was that, um, you know, I'm, I'm more of an environmentalist. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm going to lean on this side of this argument if the argument exists, which I guess it kind of does. The Endangered Species Act can encourage some preemptive habitat construction, I mean, destruction. So if there is a candidate species, that doesn't mean that it's um, listed yet. And that doesn't mean that there's critical habitat set aside. And one example of this, of, um, this preemptive habitat destruction is the red cockaded woodpecker. So I'd encourage you to check out this website. It's an article written by uh, Richard L. Stroop, who was from uh, both North Carolina State University and Montana State University. And basically he said, he argues that uh, when the red cockaded woodpecker was a candidate to be listed, lumber companies went into these lawn, um, old growth lawn leaf pine forests and preemptively cut down the trees um, just to get the trees out of there, just to get them cut down before it was listed. They knew it was going to be listed. They knew that that habitat was going to be protected afterwards. So they went in there and they cut down what they could before it was listed. Um, kind of, you know, blitzkrieg approach. And then there's some criticism about the effectiveness of um, getting species onto the Endangered Species Act. So about um, as of 2019, there was a backlog about 500 species awaiting determination. It's supposed to take two years to get a species listed, but in reality, it takes about 12 years. All right. It is definitely an underfunded program, just like anything environmental in the federal government. Um, about 50 species have gone extinct while waiting listings. So we could have saved these species, but they have gone extinct. Um, a lot of people think erroneously that listing an area's critical habitat means that it becomes a wildlife refuge or a wilderness area. It does not. It does not mean that people lose their property. It just means that they can't um, uh, alter that property. It means that they can't, you know, chop down the trees or drain the wetland or whatever else they may want to do on that property. Okay. But it does not affect their land ownership or allow the government to take their land. And finally, the effectiveness of the act itself. Less than 50 species have been delisted from the Endangered Species Act. Um, I think that this was the number that I misspokenly said 11 earlier. Um, about 50 species have been removed. So not very many. Since 1973, only 50 species or less than 50 species have been removed or delisted from the Endangered Species Act. But that might actually be a good thing. By keeping them on the act, it means that those protections are still valid. So for example, um, there was a movement um, a couple years ago, maybe even last year, to delist um, the gray wolf from the Endangered Species Act certain populations of the gray wolf from the Endangered Species Act in the Yellowstone area. Um, there was a lot of arguments for and against that. One of the arguments for keeping them on the list was that the habitat outside of the national park would still be um, protected and that um, those individuals would not be able to be shot outside of the national park because uh, they are shot by ranchers. All right. Um, 11 11 um, animals have gone extinct while on the Endangered Species Act. So while listed, they have become extinct. Um, th this includes all these ones listed here. And an additional 22 were declared extinct in 2021. So just last year, bringing that up to, um, what is that, 33 total species. Okay, gone extinct while on the Endangered Species Act. And then... Um, the National Marine Fishery Service uh, lists eight species among the most risk of extinction in the near future, and that includes these guys.